for biomarkers. So can we have your votes on this, please? Are you for it or again? Do you agree, yes or no? No abstentions. Okay. So it would seem the proposals have a job on their hands, but we, do, we are blessed with having two extremely good proposers and opposers plus seconders. And the debate is 15 minutes for the proposer, 15 minutes for the opposer, the seconders five minutes each, then you can ask questions, then the, the proposer and the opposer have one minute summing up, then we have a second vote, and then we go and eat. Okay? So, if I might invite the proposer of this preposterous motion, <laughs> someone called Dr. Keith Wilson, who I believe is Welsh anyway, <laughs> I mean, what can we, else can we expect from the Welsh, who is now going to support and propose the motion in the most vigorous of fashions, but only has 15 minutes. Well, I'd like to thank the um, organizers for, and Sam in particular, for inviting me to um, propose this motion. Um, I don't mind declaring that my score on the mycology score was zero, um, <laughs> but then there weren't any hematology slides included. And um, my job is to convince you, and I can see I have to convince the majority of you, that radiology and clinical acumen are sufficient to guide IFD management without the need for biomarkers. Now, I'm going to take um, this from the transplant standpoint because um, most of the patients who come for transplantation have underlying immunosuppressive type disorders. The treatment is itself immunosuppressive. And as a result, opportunistic infection remains a severe challenge. Um, transplantation, for those of you who might not be very familiar, can broadly be divided into two categories. Autologous, where the patient and donor are one and the same, and allogeneic, where the donor is either a family member, typically a sibling, or an unrelated volunteer. Now, these are the type of pictures that we show our patients when they come for counseling. And in the standard allogeneic setting, a patient might come to transplant with low-level so-called minimal residual disease. We give high doses of chemo radiotherapy followed by stem cell infusion, and then they recover with the immune system of the donor. Most people are not young or fit enough to receive this kind of treatment because this is restricted typically to people under the age of 35. So the majority would get what we call the reduced intensity approach, where the conditioning is largely aimed at immunosuppression so that the host immune system doesn't reject the stem cells. Some patients would then recover with full donor hemopoiesis, as shown here, but a significant proportion would exhibit so-called mixed chimerism, where both donor and recipient stem cell or cells can be um, dis um, identified. In the vast majority, this would spontaneously move in that direction, but if it gets stuck or in a worst case scenario goes in the reverse direction, we can restore that using donor T cells. If we try to make the transplant too light, which improves the safety of it, the risk is that the recipient might reject the donor cells. Now, failure from transplantation falls into two main categories, the toxicity of the transplant itself and disease recurrence. And tonight, we're going to be looking primarily at infection as the significant toxic event. This is some data from the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, with international data showing that in the sibling setting, um, death from infection accounts for just over 10%. And that increases to nearly one in five when the donor is unrelated. And when we consider that the international trend is for increasing numbers of unrelated donor transplantation, we can see that problems related to infection are only set to increase. Given that that is the case, we need a test that should and could enable us to detect infection at an early stage before it becomes established so that we can treat when we have a modicum of success. So what would an ideal screening test look like? Well, given that it would need to be applied to large numbers of patients over a repeated period of time, it needs to be cheap 
because if you spend all your money on the screening tests, then you'd have no money left to do the treating when the test proves positive. It clearly needs to be sensitive because if it's screening, it should identify virtually everybody with the um, condition and therefore can fulfill its criterion as an early warning system. However, sensitivity should not be at the expense of specificity because we don't want too many false positives necessitating further um, confirmatory tests because then that would defeat the, the cost option. And finally, from a laboratory perspective, we need a fairly reasonable turnaround time so that we can act on the result because there's no point having a very sensitive test which you're not going to get back for another two to three weeks. So, a picture tells a thousand words, so here is an interesting case study. So this is a gentleman who presented with T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia at age 48 in 2005. He was treated on the UK ALL 12 protocol and received induction phase one, which contains significant quantities of steroid. Due to the fact that patients receive a lot of vincristine during phase one, um, fungal prophylaxis with azoles are normally contraindicated due to the risk of um, bowel complications. During phase two and before he became neutropenic, he developed pleuritic chest pain and had an antibiotic resistant fever. Blood cultures were repeatedly sterile, as was bronchoscopy, and peripheral blood screening gave a solitary positive result for Aspergillus by PCR, but his ELISA remained negative. A high resolution CT scan of the chest, and these are just two representative samples, slices, showed the typical dense opacities in a localized fashion with the ground glass halo, consistent with an aspergillus um, infection. Now, many of you would know more than I would about the EORTC MSG criteria. And even though the revised 2008 criteria would not have been available in 2005, if we retrospectively apply it to him, he would fall into this category where he has the necessary host factors, we have typical clinical factors, but we don't have mycological proof because PCR is not considered um, adequate as evidence of mycology. Now, I, I don't pay too much attention to what you call treatment at various stages, um, and that is not the point. But, but the, he would be labeled as having possible infection, and according to the EORTC, no definite evidence of invasive fungal disease. How, however, even though I'm arguing against the case for screening in the effort of fairness, I, I would point out that th th there were several caveats. First of all, the patient had been on antifungal therapy for over a month prior to his bronchoalveolar lavage. Now, I mentioned that tests need to be done in a timely fashion, and something like a bronchoalveolar lavage should be done early in the course of the illness. Some hospitals have access to that. We are not one of those. And it took us a month before we could convince the respiratory physicians to do the test. Now, in the meantime, the physicians treated him, as you can see, with a variety of antifungal agents. Um, when the bronchoalveolar lavage is done, you're at the mercy of the operator to send the samples for the tests that you requested. So, surprise, surprise, no ELISA was performed on the BAL specimen. And the first actual blood PCR was performed nearly two months after the onset of symptoms. And I'm not sure whether that's because of when we actually started screening or whether it was a result of physician awareness. I mean, at this time, he's not under the transplant team. He's still under the general hemato-oncologist. Nevertheless, he was treated with voriconazole, and although I'm not going to show it to you, um, his chest symptoms improved. Now, because of the poor long-term outcome with ALL in the adult setting, if treated only with chemotherapy, he was referred for a stem cell transplant given that he had an HLA-compatible sister, and this was done in January of 2006. 
Reduced intensity conditioning that I showed you before is actually not proven in the context of ALL and we therefore opted to give him full intensity conditioning despite the higher mortality risk in a patient of his age. And to help reduce that, GVHD prophylaxis was with cyclosporin and mycophenolate rather than the typical cyclosporin and methotrexate. Now, our practice has been that in anybody with a potential prior invasive fungal disease, to offer um, secondary prophylaxis with granulocyte therapy, which at the time was available only on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday basis, given that it was um, retrieved from the Buffy coat. And then whatever agent previously showed itself to be effective, we would give that. Now, it's very difficult to determine how long you should continue prophylaxis for, given that this patient would be on immunosuppressive therapy for at least six months post-transplant. So the original plan was, since voriconazole caused clinical and radiological improvement, we would continue that until he was off his immunosuppressive therapy. However, after about two months due to liver toxicity, voriconazole was changed to weekly ambisome, and after a further month due to renal toxicity, ambisome was changed to itraconazole. Nevertheless, with consistent screening for both ELISA and PCR, he remained negative, he was clinically well, and we had no evidence of recurrence of his prior presumed IFD. At six months, he had had prior acute graft versus host disease, which had resolved. He had two episodes of CMV reactivation, which had resolved. But by nine months, he now had evidence of chronic graft versus host disease and was now restarted on immunosuppression. We have a four-drug prophylactic cocktail for patients with chronic GVHD, as is shown on the slide. Now, graft versus host disease is itself an immunosuppressive condition. And given that it is the immune system of the, of the donor acting against host tissue, and it's treated with immunosuppressive agents, you're almost compounding the immunosuppressive nature. And unsurprisingly, he experienced recurrent infections. At that time, he was being readmitted to hospital roughly on a monthly basis. So we added in intravenous immunoglobulin, and that brought the um, admissions down to roughly about two or three times a year. We normally re-immunize at um, one year. We were a bit late in him, and, but we did it, and, and I realized that I forgot to put in um, pertussis as one of the things that we also immunize against. I don't think in 2007 we were immunizing against meningo um, men C, which, which we now do. Now, when I say infectious complications, I mean infectious complications. And I, I think our trainees see more virology than our microbiology trainees, with all due respect to our microbiology trainees. And it's just to give you a, 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 a sample of the infections that we had to treat from 2006 going all the way to 2014. And indeed, 2013 was the only year that we did not isolate an infectious pathogen from this patient. Not to be outdone, he also had an impressive list of non-infectious complications as well, as you can see there. Now, in June 2012, so this is now um, six and a half years after his transplant, he presented with a five-day history of generalized muscle pain, weakness. He could no longer walk, he couldn't straight leg lift, and he was passing dark urine. As a consequence of his long-term cyclosporin therapy, his lipids were elevated. This is a well-known complication. He was seen by a general physician who was presumably unaware that he was on cyclosporin and had started him on statins. Um, that can cause rhabdomyolysis, and his, he presented with a creatinine kinase of over 130,000 which peaked at over 170,000 before he started to improve. He was admitted to hospital. He was treated aggressively with hydration. On the advice of the renal physicians, we alkalinized his urine. And they also recommended that we stop itraconazole because they said that there was an association with rhabdomyolysis in transplant patients. 
After 10 days, he was well enough to be discharged, and we had planned to change prophylaxis to posaconazole because by that time, there was emerging, albeit weak, evidence of posaconazole efficacy against, um, anti um, against fungal pathogens in the GVHD setting. Two months later, he presented with new onset right-sided weakness, no headache, and his antifungal prophylaxis, which should have been switched to posaconazole, actually had not happened. However, he had continued regular screening for aspergillus by both ELISA and PCR, and apart from two isolated positive samples on those states, all his screening was persistently negative. On the right, you see a T2-weighted scan, and I'm not sure if it will project to the back of the room, and he had three isolated lesions, and this was the biggest one, showing um, a lesion here with a lot of mass effect due to edema. And this is a diffusion-weighted scan, which um, shows the lesion more conspicuously. OK. The neurosurgeons were reluctant to biopsy because of the risk of brain damage and seeding. So we treated him clinically with voriconazole, resulting in clinical and radiological improvement. Again, regular aspergillus screening remained negative. This is his scan one year later, at which point he was put back on itraconazole. And this is just to show you what his screening looked like. In 2008, when he was clinically well, he actually had an ELISA of 4.8, which I take it is positive. It spontaneously went to normal. Here is 2011. Here is where he had his rhabdomyolysis. The PCR was inhibitory, whatever that means, not reproducible. And as you can see, ELISA persistently positive. This is when he had his brain lesions. This is what he had afterwards, and he remains well on itraconazole without any screening. So in summary, this was an adult male with acute lymphoblastic leukemia with a possible invasive fungal disease during induction. He had a transplant with chronic extensive disease, um, GVHD, numerous infective and non-infective complications, and a possible CNS aspergillomata when he had no prophylaxis. Notice that his screening was persistently negative. This is it. So the point is this. Having demonstrated that clinical and radiological acumen in this particular case was sufficient to guide management in a patient who was at significantly increased risk with no meaningful assistance from biomarker screening, this house rests. Well, proof positive, you might say. However, we do have an excellent opposer. You'll notice that the proposer and the opposer are not English. We have a, had a Welshman, we're now have, going to have a Scot. What is it with you, English? Do you not have any talent? Uh, sorry, <coughs> Brian, please come and oppose this motion and see if you can convince the audience otherwise. Okay, I'm going to try and base my argument uh, in contrast to Keith on more than one case. Okay, um, <laughs> now I, I'll, I freely admit that my uh, <coughs> initial preparations for this debate were, were not uh, good. I, uh, I read the motion out to my wife, who's a microbiologist as well, who looks after hemonc patients, and her response was, "Yeah, that sounds about right." Okay, so no matter, she works in Edinburgh. Um, now, I, I, I'm not going to stand up here and say that I've devoted my entire professional career to uh, fungal diagnostics, but I have had a passing interest, and I once even published a paper. It's true. So I must admit that wh when I listen to Keith, I, I can only feel slightly offended, to, to be honest with you. And as you know, I come from Glasgow. Um, whoops. And in... in <laughs> In Glasgow, we, we, we have a way of, of settling arguments, which, which, generally involves, which generally involves an exclamation of stitch this, uh, followed by a visit to an accident in the emergency department. <laughs> However, given that um, Keith is bigger than me and we're, we're in these uh, very splendid surroundings, I thought 
I would take a more thoughtful approach, um, but not too thoughtful. <laughs> so um, Keith and his uh, uh, assistant would, would have you believe that uh, all we need to manage IFD in these patients, and I am sticking to hemonc patients, is, is radiology and clinical acumen. Now, I know for those of you under 50, this probably doesn't mean anything, but that's, doc <laughs> that's, that's Dr. Kildare. Um, now, I, I don't know how you actually measure um, diagnostic accuracy or, or clinical, measure the diagnostic accuracy of clinical acumen, but I'm prepared to bet that the confidence intervals are pretty wide. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm prepared to admit that uh, radiology in the form of high resolution CT scanning is the bedrock of our uh, management strategy for, for IFD and hemonc patients. And the, the characteristic signs are, are easily recognizable uh, to the trained eye. Um, so this slide shows the, the well-known study by Green, which was a, an analysis of, of the Herbex-Foriconazole study. And this showed that we see macronodules in 91% of the patients. Well, that's all very well, but by the time you see macronodules, your disease is already extremely well advanced, and it's very difficult to treat these patients with a good outcome. And the much heralded halo sign is only seen in 61%. So in Scottish money, that means that nearly half your patients uh, don't actually have this, this sign that is supposed to be pathognomonic. And the other thing is, and Liz, as, <coughs> excuse me, Liz showed a slide that was uh, very similar to this, that it's actually very difficult to interpret um, CT scans. This is a slide that I borrowed from Rosemary several years ago and, 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 and never sent back. Um, and, and you can see that <coughs> we have six CT scans here that all look as though they might be invasive uh, aspergillosis, but in actual fact, only two of them are. Okay, so what are we trying to do? Well, we're, we're trying to achieve better outcomes for our patients and we're trying to spend less money. The NHS mantra is treat more, treat better, but do it with less money. And, and I, I would suggest to you that we're really not doing very well. The top graph shows uh, survival data from the Transnet data series, which is a huge 16,000 patient US study. And you can see that the, the one year survival in IA is 25%. That is derisory, isn't it? And if you look at the, the, the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde antimicrobial spend last year, on antifungals, we spent £3.29 million. And 40% of that was in the west of Scotland, Beats and Cancer Centre. Okay, so we're not doing very well for our patients and we're spending a shed load of money in achieving that. So everybody in this room knows the various different management strategies that we use to treat or to manage um, invasive fungal disease in hemonc. <clears throat> the only one, I'm not going to talk about prophylaxis and perigo targeted, but preemptive. Preemptive therapy is about treating patients at the earliest possible uh, uh, moment. It's about achieving better outcomes, and it's about treating appropriately. There's no point in getting to this targeted therapy stage if you're actually treating something that you think is invasive aspergillosis, but actually isn't, okay? And we have the tools that will allow us to do that. And these tools are biomarkers. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, over the course of the day, especially in the morning, um, several speakers described these various different tests that were available to us. So I'm just going to recap briefly and show you some analytical data. So please bear with me. Um, we have the Platelia Galactoman Analyza. This test is marvelous. It, it's the bee's knees. It absolutely does what it says on the tin. It allows you to diagnose invasive aspergillosis, and it allows you to do it at an early stage in the infection. You know, it's over 12 years now since uh, Johan Martens in Leuven, in Belgium, showed the performance of this test in his group of patients. And if you look there at the bottom, you can see that the performance of this assay is actually better than the performance of every, every other clinical trigger. And it's not only better, but it became positive. The test becomes positive before any of these other triggers for treatment. Okay, so 
Much has been said about the, the, the impact of prevalence or pretest probability, whatever you want to call it, on the performance of this test. If we look at the positive predictive value, and this is Pfeiffer's uh, meta-analysis, then you can see that as the prevalence increases, and you know, believe it or not, some centres do have a rate of 20%, then you can see that the PPV improves. It's not brilliant, but it gets up to about 70%. But the negative predictive value remains a remarkably good figure of over 90%. Okay. Johan also showed how this test performs extremely well in BAL fluid. And Zhu's meta-analysis, published recently, um, showed that at a cutoff of one, the test performance was exemplary. So this really is a very good test. Ignore what all these naysayers uh, would tell you. So how can galactomanan help us in the management of our patients? Well, we can use it as a screening test with a cutoff of 0.5. A negative test effectively excludes invasive aspergillosis, while a positive test says it's possible. If we use it in BAL fluid to confirm a diagnosis with a cutoff of one, then a positive test strongly supports the diagnosis when it's accompanied by appropriate uh, other clinical signs, and a negative test effectively rules out invasive aspergillosis. But why would you listen to me? I'm just a jobbing microbiologist from north of the wall. This is what the experts say, the ESO3 guidelines. I was actually there, but I didn't say much. Um, they, recommend, they recommend that you use this test to prospectively monitor your patients. They recommend that it should be used as part of a diagnostic-driven strategy. And they also recommend, not such a strong recommendation, but they recommend that it can be used in BAL fluid to support the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis. So like I say, what a wonderful test this is. We've heard much about the lateral flow device from Chris and others. I'm not going to say much about it other than, you know, it's one of these next generation monoclonals. It detects a, 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 a novel antigen that's only expressed by living organisms. And the test performance is really on a par, perhaps not quite so good in some studies, but on a par with galactomanan. But the great advantage, as Chris pointed out, is that it's a very rapid test. Glucan is also available to us. Of course, glucan will identify more fungi than the galactomanan test will. There's much less experience with this test. I really don't know much about it at all. But several studies would indicate that the sensitivity and specificity are in the healthy range. So enough about them. What about aspergillus? We've been kicking the aspergillus football around the pitch for two decades now. Herman Einsley published his first paper, I think, in 19... 97. And yes, there is a problem with Aspergillus PCR, and that problem, as everyone knows, is the lack of standardization. We have literally scores of protocols out there. And as you can see from this meta-analysis from Mengoli five years ago now, that the performance is all over the place. But it's important to remember, if you ignore the ones that have blanked out, that several studies actually perform really quite well. So because of this lack of standardization, the European Aspergillus PCR initiative was founded, chaired very ably, I must say, not that I'm uh, obsequious, but uh, by Peter uh, and um, Rosemary. And, and who's the other guy? Jürgen, Jürgen, sorry. Um, so, and and, this, and this, this organization really has made huge strides in achieving a degree of standardization. I'm not going to say how they've gone about it, but they have made a, a, a number of quite fundamental uh, recommendations for anyone who wants to develop an assay. And I'm not going to say what they are, but the proof is in the pudding. And if, if you compare the performance of centers that, that use assays that include these basic recommendations against the centers that are non-compliant, then the difference in sensitivity and diagnostic odds ratio is highly significant. The specificity is numerically better, although that wasn't significant. So it's quite clear that by taking some simple steps that you can develop PCR assays that actually have a very good performance. And again, PCR, like galactomanan, has been used in BAL fluid. This is Sun's meta-analysis um, of, of, oh gosh, lo loads of studies. Um, I can't really see that without falling off the stage. 
Um, but if, if you look at uh, uh, um, the, 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 the performance of the test comparing proven and probable versus possible and no IA, then you can see that the numbers again are extremely encouraging. And if you look at the receiver operating curve, then the area under the curve is 0.97. This is an extremely well performing test. Whoops, forgot that. Anyway. It doesn't really matter if I harp on about analytical sensitivity. At the end of the day, what does that really mean? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. How, does, how do these tests perform uh, in the clinical setting? Rosemary showed you a few this morning. Let me show you some others and perhaps repeat one or two. This was Johan Martin's study. It's now 10 years old when he used galactaman and CT-guided therapy in a, a group of uh, allogeneic stem cell transplants. He had 117 neutropenic fever episodes. In 19, he had 19 cases of proven and probable invasive aspergillosis, and that all 19 of these were detected by the galactomanan test. Nine of these cases occurred in patients who had antibiotic-resistant neutropenic fever, but 10 of them actually had no evidence and would not have been picked up by empirical therapy. He reduced his antifungal use by 78%, and his IA survival was on a par with other studies. Catherine Cordonnier's prevert study. This was a, 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 a double arm study, two arm study, preemptive using galactomana and radiology and other clinical signs, <coughs> excuse me, versus empirical therapy. And you can see the rate of invasive fungal disease, but, <coughs> excuse me, we get any water, Peter? Um, you can see a significant reduction in antifungal treatment uh, in favour of the preemptive arm. And again, survival at the end of the study was um, pretty much equivalent. That's champagne. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. No, you can keep the water, Peter. And then I had to show this, I had to show Rosemary's study. This was a very nice study, again, just a single arm study, but <clears throat> Rosemary used twice weekly Aspergillus candida PCR and Galactaman in, in combination to screen patients um, who had neutropenic fever or who had graft versus host disease. And she removed the antifungal empirical treatment arm. Um, if patients were on effective prophylaxis um, and unless they had uh, biomarker positivity or other clinical signs. And you can see very briefly that there were 57 patients who were PCR and ELISA negative. Okay, and these patients did not receive antifungal treatment. I don't know what the percentage reduction in her antifungal use was, but her cost savings, and this was over six months, were quite considerable. Increased diagnostic expenditure of 75, but if you look at that over a year, you're looking at £100,000 saving, and that's enough to transplant another patient. Okay, I should point out that uh, six of the patients actually received empirical uh, antifungal treatment, but that was the fear factor, and given that her husband was the haematologist. Oh, was it you? Right, okay. Well, I rest my case. And then finally, there is this really nice study from Orla Morrissey in Australia, multi-centre study, and this is the best study that we have to date that compares a biomarker di Thank you. Spot on. A biomarker diagnosis group versus a standard diagnosis group. And you can see that uh, empirical therapy was significantly reduced in the biomarker group, a significant p-value. Mortality was numerically lower, but not significantly lower in the biomarker arm. And there was an increased incidence of invasive aspergillosis in the biomarker arm. But that's not surprising, given that you're using, invasive, you're using galactomanan, which is one of the EORTC criteria. Okay. So, I think that there is very good analytical evidence there to support biomarkers. I think that is... Uh, ably backed up by our experience in, in the clinic. Um, I, I don't think that there is an 
absolute way that you have to use biomarkers. I think each individual institution may well have to decide how they want to use them. But the evidence is there that biomarkers do have an impact. They reduce antifungal use. Um, there's a possibility that they may increase survival. Of course, this is the, the, the study, the EORTC, EORTC study, that is currently recruiting, probably going to finish around August time, and the results will be very interesting. So, I would suggest that unless you're a member of the Flat Earth Society, or your head is stuck where the sun doesn't shine, <laughs> then I suggest that you use your common sense and you take a responsible approach to the management of your patients. And but yes, there is an Irish whisky called Fecken Irish whisky. Then I, I, I would urge you, on the basis of, of overwhelming evidence, to reject this motion. Thank you. So, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I did notice, of course, we're kind of slipping. We had a fungus that was dangerously close to a nice Anglo-Saxon expletive earlier on, and he's now introducing fecking. Please, could you keep this uh, clean for the following speakers? And no more of these expletives. After all, look around the hall there. These, the portraits have turned round and faced the wall. So without further ado, I'm now going to invite the first of the seconders, Vanya Gant, who is probably well known to you all. Where is Vanya? Vanya, you have five minutes to support the case in favour of the motion. I have every confidence that you will succeed. Please. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I've just got a few comments. Of course, those of you who know me know that I never, ever, ever, ever swear or am lewd or ribald in any way. And the other thing I'd like to ask you to do is in deference to my previous speaker, my esteemed colleague, is to hold hands to see whether we can contact the living. Anyway, uh, on, on that note, uh, I think it's important for me to state that the views tonight uh, are not necessarily the views of the speaker, but I would urge you, all of you, to remember that what I'm going to talk about involves now, it's today. I don't want you to conflate what might be promise with reality. So I'm talking about patients now. So let's get into evidence-based medicine. There's a rule. It's really pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty powerful mantra these days. That's what we do, isn't it? We do evidence-based medicine. We just love this sort of stuff. We love these numbers. They empower us to make decisions of life and death sometimes about our patients. Unfortunately, if you actually do look at the evidence, and I won't bore you with uh, receiver operator curves particularly, I actually wrote a 300-page book with some colleagues on this sort of high-dimensional mathematics and the promise of models. Okay, so don't think I'm that much of a Luddite. I don't think I am. But if you look at those curves, they don't look right, do they? They really don't look right. The science and the data tell us that they're not perfect. And in fact, they're nowhere near perfect. And several of you in the audience, in fact, wrote a little uh, editorial about this particular paper. And all this tells you is that the red lines and the blue lines and the dots don't always line up at the same time in individual patients. Fine. So that's what we're looking at, isn't it? That's what these tests that we now have tell you. And in fact, even though that's wrapped around a bit, I translate that into something between no way, probably no way, I don't think so, it might be, it looks like it, I'm pretty convinced now. That is the reality of the number that comes out of the laboratory. So let's just go back, you know, see, you get old, you know, how old, Old buffers, you know, they say, oh, you know, and they get interested and they start contributing to charities and they get interested in history. I, well, maybe I'm there, but this guy, and he was a Canadian, which 
It's quite extraordinary, really, said that. And of course, if that's true, what we tend to do these days is we go for guidelines. We're all a bit uncomfortable. It's very complicated. We've got to get guidelines. And you won't be able to read that, and you're not meant to. They're neutropenic guidelines. Why do we do this? Because it imposes order in chaos. It makes you feel better. But ladies and gentlemen, a lot of you may end up in your comfort zone and you think you're doing the right thing and you'll plough on with standard operating procedures and guidelines and you'll die. You'll die. <laughs> and the magic is not in the guidelines. Watch carefully. Watch, 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 watch. Uh, I very much hope we might be able to ask you to vote. And do I click again? No? Okay, so with a bit of music or whatever, can, you, can they vote now? Vote. And what we find is <laughs> and might I just suggest that very few questions were answered with an 88% majority today why why because because of your eyes and your brains remember those no guidelines I'm talking your heads okay what this is about okay this is about riding a bicycle. That's the science that attempts to prove that it has to do with a gyroscopic force that makes your brains be able to do that. Well, the answer is the science doesn't know why people can ride bicycles. Fact. So, the science has moved from the CT scan on the left and one of the speakers today made this really good point. That's a th relatively thick slice, and that's a thin slice one, and that's better, and that's not normal. So you're going to say, okay, you know, you, you, who cares about the pictures? Here's two transplants. Now, use your brains, okay? No numbers, no galactomanan. Use your clinical brain. So, which one has got the fungus, or do they both have? Okay, okay, read, think, assimilate the information. This is real life, right? Now, which one's got the fungus? You got the point? You got the point? That's using your clinical head. Now, you may look at that, and a lot of you are going to go, I've got no idea what that is. I know what it is, because I've seen it before. And that's actually a patient with histiocytosis X, and it's a classic appearance, and the dendritic cells in those lesions were of donor origin. But I would be a fool to say that X-rays could see bugs. They can't. But tissue is always the issue. And the reason I love CT scans is because if I don't know what to do then, and very often you don't, I get one of my mates to get some of that. And only last week, a barn door case of aspergillus that wasn't behaving correctly turned out to be full of acid fast bacilli. But the whole point about the process is the holistic care. It's the intelligence. And don't let anybody tell you that in 2015 it's a science of certainty. It is not, and it continues not to be. I'd like it to be, but it's not. These people, and I love that Norman Rockwell picture, these people are doctors, they're doctors, they're individuals who devote their lives to caring for patients. And that does not only mean thoughtless protocolization with no, almost no, no feeling for this extraordinarily complex business that we're in, and it's becoming more complex with immunosuppression. So just to finish off, William Mosler said that. Ain't no galactomannan or beta-glucan today going to turn the first guy into the second guy. Fact. My conclusions are, 
CT scans tell the truth, and their interpretation has to do with who looks at them. Experience, experiential knowledge, is what human beings are about. That is the greatness of the human race. Serum antigen tests give you a number. Not quite like electrolytes. If my potassium is 9, I'm in trouble. We all know that. If my galactamana is 1.1, I might be. Patients are not just donors of serum samples. The truth is out there. It's called a biopsy or a seriously validated BCR and more power to you to make that work and to deliver it. And of course, we're all guilty with this one because let's face it, 90% plus of my patients that I uh, uh, contribute, whose care I contribute to at UCLH die with no diagnosis because we don't do the postmortems anymore. So it's all okay talking about all this stuff, but until you can validate with tissue, most of us are just talking hot air. So, what's going to work for your patient, you and your patient? Or, my case rests. I have your notes here. Did you intend them to be left behind? <laughs> it's full of expletives. OK. I'm now going to call upon um, Dr. Ellis, who I believe works in this place, who was fuming and fizzing and exploding during the last half hour or so. So he now has the right to speak, to speak his mind, and to convince you to vote against this motion. So, Stephen, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I must admit, I've enjoyed all the talks. I particularly enjoyed the last one. And as a radiologist, seeing complete and utter clinical stupidity, I must admit I love the idea of clinical acumen actually being put to the forefront and being used. But there's a limit. And the trouble is, in this case, clinical acumen is relying on something it shouldn't be relying on, and that's the radiology. Uh, this is my quiz paper. OK, I got two right. OK, and that's because I'm a parent, so I recognised Harry Potter and the pregnancy test. But the radiology question, <laughs> I got that wrong. I don't mind admitting it. OK, so what, I mean, CT scan, I mean, it is a very important tool, undoubtedly. Chest x-ray being normal just isn't good enough. If the chest x-ray is abnormal, you could argue the toss that if there's a decent amount of consolidation, some nodules, some lymphadenopathy, you might have a pretty good idea of what the patient might have, and you might not need the CT. I don't think any of you are brave enough to do that. You'll probably get the CT anyway. But if the CT is normal and you've got fever and it's neutropenic, then you're going to end up doing a CT. Subtle changes beneath the resonance of CT of chest X-ray obviously can be hidden. In fact, you can hide a mass of seven centimeters on the chest X-ray, so you're going to need a CT at some point. Mediastinal adenopathy can be hidden, so it's another good reason for doing it. And this EORTC criteria of new infiltrate really makes my skin crawl. Anyone want to define what a new infiltrate is? It's an extra bit of white on the CT. I could scan everyone in this room, and I bet I'd find a bit of white on about 10% of you. So it's not very useful, really. I do want to go through volume versus non-contiguous. Whatever institution you come from, you really ought to be doing contiguous volume imaging now through the chest. I used to be clinging on to non-contiguous imaging because the thin sections were better quality. The new CT scanners, the thin sections are just as good a quality, and you get much more confidence. So uh, I'm going to go through a few slides. And this slide's changed over the last four years for me. Uh, this is a scale of justice. You get greater confidence in your diagnosis from a volume CT, definitely. OK, here's a cavitating nodule, or is it? On a volume CT, you can do an NPR reconstruction, if I just quickly flick through. And you'll see, actually, on an oblique NPR, it's, it's an airway going through it. So it's not a cavitating nodule at all. Now, you, on a non-contiguous scan, you would have misdiagnosed that as a cavitating nodule. OK. First volume versus non-contiguous. Here you've got some consolidation, cavitation, difficult to say. On the thin section, you can see very nicely an air crescent. We'll come on to that in a minute, actually, because this just isn't what I consider air crescent, to be honest. We'll come back to that. Uh, but the thin section, much more confidence. 
there's an increased dose, so the balance goes the other way. Can we justify the dose on these patients? There's a quick rundown of the radiation exposure. Having said that, we get a much better idea of nodules on the volume scan. So that, for me, takes the balance back the other way. OK, here's a case of tree and bud. On a volume scan, you can do a MIP image, and you can see it beautifully shows up the tree and bud opacity, which is a very different pathology to just straightforward nodules. Let's just move through all the scans. I don't want to take too long doing this. That's without the MIP. You can see you've got nodules, you've got bronchiectasis, but you can't be sure it's tree and bud. Tree and bud is endobronchial plugging. Nodules aren't necessarily endobronchial. They may be interstitial or straightforward parenchymal. Okay, there are a few studies comparing volume HRC to your non-contiguous. That was before the scanners were that fast, to be honest. But there is a problem with a volume scan when you reconstruct, you take a certain amount of time of data to reconstruct that axial image. So you do get a problem of motion artifact, particularly cardiac motion artifact. You can see, I need to point at this one, I think. There we go. You can see here the cardiac motion is more marked on the right, which is the volume scanning. But that is less so now as the scanners have moved on, they've got faster. So quality initially was a bit of an issue. And four years ago, I said we should still be doing non-contiguous in general. Probably not for you guys, though, not for the fungal infection. But now that's out of it. So now I don't do any non-contiguous scanning. It's all volume. And anyone out there who has institutions that do non-contiguous CT scanning, stop it, do volumes. So normal chest X, we were talking about this new infiltrate. There are all sorts of things that could be considered new infiltrate. Would you treat any of those as an invasive fungus infection, aspergillus? On the ERTC, you should say, say you should. They're all new infiltrates. Fever, neutropenic, you've got those. I mean, we've seen lovely examples of classic fungal infection. Oh, great. And classic mercomycosis. Didn't get that one. But new infiltrate really does give it a huge spectrum. And it's, the CT is just not specific enough. So what are you seeking? What is actually the question? Are you looking for a specific diagnosis of fungal infection? Or are you just looking for an idea that there is something going on with the fever and therefore you're going to treat? And I'm not, a negative CT actually might be useful. Negative predictor, possible benefit to that. But positive predictor in terms of uh, what's going on, not good. So let's move on. This is what I consider an air crescent sign. That's on a chest x-ray. We see it on a CT. This is a fungal ball developing in a pre-existing cavity. The air crescent you get in acute fungal infection just doesn't seem to follow that scheme. You've got a consolidation. Where's the cavity to have the fungal ball to develop? But there's, to be fair, and we saw an example earlier with the, when I was comparing volume and non-volume, you can see you do get these air crescents. I think if you see that, you're certainly going to think aspergillus, and that's fair. And that's the one case I've seen since 2002, since I've been doing radiology at this institution. So that's a really useful test, isn't it? Then we come on to wedge-shaped consolidation. Anything can do that. It could be an infarct. Consolidation and halo. My god, the halo sign. There's nothing saintly about the halo sign. And by the way, the reverse halo sign, which we saw earlier, was first described in organized pneumonia. And we have subsequently described it in umpteen other conditions. It certainly isn't a pathological confirmation of fungal infection. Ground glass opacity. So just exactly what is going on here? I'm going to clip through these quite quickly. Ground glass opacity. If you imagine this is a chunk of lung tissue, the black is the airspace, this is the vessel and vascular structures, and this is the, uh, the connective tissue of the interstitium. There are two ways you can get ground glass opacity on a CT scan because the CT is just going to show the increase in density. You can displace the air, so partial airspace filling will increase the density of the lung. It will give you ground glass. Or you can thicken up the interstitium. Again, you're displacing the air. You're creating ground glass. The, the classic halo in aspergillus is this phenomenon. It's actually alveolar hemorrhage. With the aspergillus getting into the vessels, causing alveolar hemorrhage, and that's why you get your ground glass. But that anything that fills the air spaces will give you ground glass. So the, actually to accept it to be due to hemorrhage, secondary to invasive aspergillus, is really pushing out the boat in terms of the possibilities. Here's an example. That's 
Basically, what we see on the CT, there's the vessel, there's the aerated lung, and there's the bronchus alongside. As it starts consolidating, the airspace fills up. Consolidation at the center of the infection will fill up first, and you get consolidation. Here, it hasn't quite completely filled up. Bingo, you've got yourself a consolidation with a halo, and nothing to do with alveolar hemorrhage, no specificity to that at all. So for God's sake, don't talk about halo and consolidation. It's absolute nonsense. For two reasons. One, it's nonsense. And two, a halo is supposed to be round. So a halo surely has got to be round a nodule. And this is the danger of taking a sign, finding it relates to something, and then thinking it applies to everything else. It doesn't. It really annoys me. <laughs> Nodules. OK, well-defined nodule. Is that helpful? This is back to our new infiltrate. Cavitating nodule. And this is, you're going to less likely go aspergillus, you might go TB. And there, I suppose, radiology has helped a little bit, but you'd still want a bug. You'd still want to actually do some form of uh, test to prove it's TB before you give them toxic medication. That cavitating nodule, by the way, let me quickly go back. That's just an attempt to consolidate on background emphysematous lung. Don't fall into that trap either. There's no way this lung can consolidate normally. It hasn't got normal um, uh, architecture. So the halo sign, associated with angio invasion, only if you get the alveolar hemorrhage. Describe the nodules relevance to consolidation, we've deemed that. Is it specific? Is this the same pathology? The lovely, well-defined, rounded nodule there, and that nodule with a halo. I must admit, I would look at that and think, ooh, ooh yeah, that does look pretty good for a halo. OK, so I would give that. But then again, what's causing that? Is it the same pathology? Here's another thing about halos, the thickness of the slice. Someone's already alluded to that, which is very worthwhile. This slide's all about that. All these nodules look like they have little indistinct halos around them. Get a thinner slice, and you actually get a much better idea that these are actually all well-defined nodules. The fact that the EIRTC criteria says plus or minus halo means this is irrelevant anyway. I think that was a histoplasmosis. This is what's happening. There's nodule. That's a nice thin slice cut through the nodule. That's what it looks like on a CT. Take the same nodule, put a slightly thicker slice, and now you'll see that there's a bit of aerated lung going to be included in the average. Remember, the CT pixel you look at is an average of the density of the thickness of that slice at that point. You include a little bit of aerated lung, and suddenly you ramp down the density. You ramp down the number, and you generate your halo. And if you take that slightly thicker slice, and we're talking about three millimeter slices here, and you cut through, not through the center of the nodule, but further up, suddenly that's exacerbated. See this area here where the curve is? That bit of air is going to be included in the appearance of a nodule. And suddenly you've got a very convincing halo. OK? And that's what's happening here. These are actually well defined. This was a histoplasmosis. But we had to take one out and look at it in order to prove that. Here's an interesting one. New infiltrates, fungal disease, yeah, great, they've got a fever. In fact, look at the lymphadenopathy, this, okay, this was disease progression. Okay, so they didn't need antifungals at all. We could always throw in PET into the mix, we've done CT, it's not, you know, it's a bit non-specific. Does PET help? No, it doesn't. In fact, we've taken out at least three um, aspergillus infections, thinking they're cancer, in the last two years. And uh, unfortunately, aspergillus is hot, cancer's hot, everything's hot, so PET, not useful. There you go. That was aspergillus. We've already talked about that. Is that the same pathology? We could ask, did you do the questions? We've got, we can do two of the questions. We've got one minute. Let me flick through that again. Okay, what is this? You've got a choice of five. You won't be able to press on your buttons because this hasn't been set up in time. I wasn't able to do it. Which one of these do you think it is? Okay, think in your mind. That was sarcoid. Yeah, see, so you're all thinking infections, aren't you? Yeah. I've got another one for you. Okay, PGP. Oh, by the way, are we going to get PCP back again? You were talking about who was talking about the uh, the various nomenclature and how they change it. Why can't we get PGP back again? I oh, know, I much prefer, prefer PCP. It rolls off the tongue. It's much better, anyway. OK, so that was PJP. We got another? 
Oh, there's a node there. What do you reckon about that one? Make it up in your mind. Well, that was the Aspergillus. Obviously. Clear. Absolutely. Blunt barn door. And this one, question four. Just the one slice. I'm going to see a show of hands in this one. I want to know who gets this one. Who reckons it's Aspergillus? Okay, who reckons PJP? You're all very brave, aren't you? Who TV? Yeah, not a bad suggestion. Wrong. Who reckons sarcoid? GVHD. And GVHD it was. This is alveolar hemorrhage, second due to GVHD. Jolly good. I hope I've demonstrated the fact that much as radiology does have a place clinically, you cannot rely on it and clinical acumen, which is a shame because I'd love clinical acumen to be enough. But in this case, I don't think it is. Thank you. I'm afraid I've just been told the kitchen is ha having apoplexy there, trying to keep our meal hot. So there's no time for questions. And there's no time for summing up. Isn't that a shame? But there is time to ask you one more time what you think of the motion. Uh, yes, this, this house believes that radiology and clinical acumen are sufficient to guide in management without the need for biomarkers. Did you change your mind? Please vote. I'm afraid. That was almost as close as the Scottish re referendum. And I'm afraid on this occasion too, the no's have it. So the motion has been thoroughly trounced and rejected. But please thank our speakers for doing their level best to convince you.